in. Hey, everyone. Uh, Michael Unger here from the Science Fair of Foundation of British Columbia. Welcome to another of our online workshops. I am coming to you from my living room uh, located on the beautiful unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. Uh, uh, lovely that you're joining us. Uh, let us know where you're joining in from. What, uh, where in the province, uh, what territory you're on. If you don't know what territory you're on, uh, you can look it up. You can ask, uh, you can ask us. We'll let you, uh, we'll, we'll look it up for you. Uh, put, put into the chat your names. Uh, I'd love to interact with you. Uh, we've got a really fun hour uh, lined up for you. Um, we are going to program your brain for future success. So, uh, this is a question that I honestly asked myself, you know, uh, not only as a kid, but like still as an adult, what if you could program your brain like a computer? Okay. What if you could tell it to things in a way that it listens, retains and changes your behavior and abilities? Does it sound like something in a movie? Well, we'll find out. Um, I'll throw into the chat, uh, if you're thinking that this sounds like a robot, throw into the chat your favorite robot of all time. I'd love to hear uh, what everyone's favorite robot is. Um, my, I don't know if it's my favorite, but I just had it on my shelf. Uh, I don't know if anyone can recognize what this is. This is a Dalek, and it's from Doctor Who. And if you're uh, saying, doesn't it look like a plunger on the end of that Dalek? Well, you would be correct, because uh, Doctor Who first filmed in the, in the 60s, and they didn't have any budget, so they literally put a plunger on the end of that robot. Um, you know, it does all the things that, that we're talking about. It, you know, measures intelligence. You know, it um, it, it helps us. Or this case not help us because Daleks are not uh, friendly. Um, but to tell us all about uh, how to uh, program our brains like computer, we have a uh, speaker, Leah Koss, uh, who's the founder and co-founder of growing organizations such as Build a Biz Kids, uh, BBK Network, and Your Current future. Leah is on a mission to change the way we value and educate people in society in order to prepare today's youth for a future filled with artificial intelligence, technology, and ongoing change. She has built platforms and education methodologies that promote the development of essential human skill development in children and youth. And Leah is here to help us program our brain for future success. Hey, Leah, how's it going? Oh, fantastic. How about you, Michael? Oh, I'm doing just great. Um, so tell us a little bit about um, how we can do this. What are you uh, about to um, tell us today? Yeah, well, that was quite a mouthful of a bio for you to <laughs> kind of have to read off there. But essentially what we're doing is we're saying, okay, what are we teaching kids? And is that going to remain relevant for the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? Who knows, right? We want to make sure that what kids are learning and doing is not only going to remain relevant, but frankly, that it's going to set kids up to have a lot of fun growing up and trying a lot of cool things and making a huge impact on on their world or other people's worlds or whatever those goals are. So that's kind of what we're going to go through today. Does that sound all right? Sounds great. All right. Fantastic. I will jump in. Now I'll just let y'all know that there will be a couple things I bring up that maybe hits really home for you. And if that's the case, you might want to grab a pen and paper in case you want to write this down. Um, but we're going to keep this pretty casual. So just to set some kind of, I don't know, open communication ground rules, if you like. If you have a question for me and you love to talk, you're a talker, I'm a talker. So if that's the case, feel welcome to unmute yourself and just jump in and say, hey, I got a question. <laughs> Can you tell me a bit about this? You won't throw me off, it's totally cool. But maybe you're more of a typer, that's all good. Type something into the chat and maybe you're a bit of both. Maybe you're like, well, I don't wanna interrupt you, but I do wanna ask you something. Just type into the chat, hey, I got a question. And then Michael can let me know, like, hey, uh, Leah, do you have do you have time for a quick question here? And then you can unmute yourself and you can say whatever is on your mind. But we're going to keep this pretty loose. I want to make sure that I can keep this as relevant as possible for you because I don't know how old all of you are. I think we've got a good variety of ages here. But the thing is, is the one thing we all have in common is the future. <laughs> It's going to change for all of us. And uh, we want to make sure that we're prepared, but more importantly, excited. I like to think about the future. It's kind of like a roller coaster. If you are really scared of the roller coaster and you're, you're not sure what's going to happen and that scares you, you are going to be holding on for dear life and hating that entire roller coaster ride. 
But if you go, oh my gosh, this is going to be an interesting experience. I'm kind of excited about the roller coaster. You're going to have such a good time. And in fact, you may love the roller coaster so much you go on it again and again. So that's how we look at the future because the future is kind of uh, a unique thing in that uh, mankind, we like to pretend we can predict the future. But I would have to say, if you've seen any of the Back to the Future movies, which is really dating myself, I don't know if you've seen those. Um, it's interesting because there's a lot of things that did happen, but a lot of things that did not happen. And some things they thought were going to be mind blowing, like having a big screen TV on your wall. But my gosh, that was like how many years ago? Um, but then other things like holograms and sneakers that do up themselves. So we can try predicting the future. And it's, um, it's a fun game. But there are a few things that we do know for certain, and that is things are going to get interesting, some things are going to get easier, and some things are going to get harder. And for you, what I wanted to focus on here is really figuring out how can you fit into the future? How can you grow up and be a really excited, happy, fulfilled person who's set up to be able to do whatever it is that you want to do? and be happy, successful, be able to buy the things that you want to buy and, and have the things you want to have and be the person that you want to be. So that's where we're going to start. We always have to start with the big picture. What is our goal? And so what is your goal? What is your dream? And one of the questions that used to always bother me growing up is people would always ask me, what do you want to be when you grow up? The tough thing is depending on how much of the world you've seen you don't actually know very many of the jobs that are out there. You know, you could be a barista at Starbucks because you see those all the time, I bet. You could work at a grocery store. You can probably do what your mom or your dad or a friend does for a living. You could be a teacher, a police officer, fireman. But there are literally hundreds of thousands, if not more, different kinds of jobs out there. And it's impossible to know what all of them are. But the thing that blows my mind is I read a statistic the other day that said 10 years from now, 80% of the jobs that are going to exist have not even been invented yet. That's crazy. So even if you tried to guess of what you wanted to be when you grew up, that job may not exist in the future and instead be replaced with a whole bunch of other really fun stuff. I think of social media so, <laughs> Michael, you might be able to relate with me on this. Um, I'm older than Google. I'm <laughs> <Me> older. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm older than Facebook. I'm also older than the Internet. Mm -hmm. And while technically, Michael, we we might not be older than the computer. However, when we were born, computers were probably like 10 in the world and they were huge and cost a billion dollars each. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember. Um, I think the first computer that I used was like an Apple II, and it uh, and it had like you know like um, the it, yeah, well, it had floppies. That? But the games, the first game that I played was just a text-based game. There was no <laughs> graphics. You would just like type in a line, and it would and it would you would talk to a computer, and it would like give you a little story, and you play along. Yeah, for sure, right? And probably a green screen. It was all green typing of some kind. It was. You know, back then when the internet came out, we were just like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. We've arrived. The future is here. The future is now. And then meanwhile, it's like, no, no, no. We're just getting started. So we laugh because Michael and I are older than Google. But when you grow up one day, <laughs> you're going to be able to tell kids, you know, I'm older than hologram phone calls, <laughs> holographic phone calls or whatever the, the new age thing is. I think they already have that technically. Um, so the future is constantly growing. It's so cool and so, so exciting. But I wanna take this back to you. So people like to ask you, what do you wanna be when you grow up? Who cares about that question is kind of what I'm getting at because whatever you say may or may not exist in your future when you graduate. But who do you want to be? So like if you were to, to close your eyes and picture yourself, picture as much as possible. Like, what are you wearing? Are there people around you? Are you on a beach? Are you in a mansion? Do you live in a penthouse condo? Do you live in a tent on the beach? Do you, are you just like covered in puppies? Like what, what is your perfect future? Who do you want to be? And then if you can, then start to see yourself in motion. 
Are you interacting with the puppies or the people? Are you walking around feeling just so powerful? Are you walking around feeling so much love? Are you walking around talking to people and they're looking at you just so interested in everything you have to say? You can figure out who that person is that you wanna be then we can start to gain some mindfulness around yourself to then start developing those skills. I call them human skills. Those are really skills that um, help you to be the person that you're excited to be and ultimately the person who's going to be really happy. That exact question, uh, when I answered it when I was a kid, my answer was I wanted to be a time traveler. You know, because <laughs> my secret identity and all those, what are all those time travel shows we had as a kid? Yeah. 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 It's like, it's not a profession. I just wanted to be a, a time traveler. And I sort of am now because, you know, I, uh, am a, a space educator. So I deal with things that are really far away in time, you know, maybe it wasn't like Marty McFly, but it's, it's eventually got there. Right. It really is. But you know, what's a really cool superpower, which is one of the skills that we're going to talk about here is you can feel like a time traveler though, because you can see a future that nobody else sees. And you're so excited about that future that you're willing to lean into it and do what it takes to get it done. So that's actually a, a great, great segue here. So let me show you a picture here. Let me know if you recognize this guy. Yeah, he was on SNL on the weekend. Yeah, he was. <laughs> Now, what's interesting about Elon is he is truly a visionary, but a lot of people look at what the companies are that he's created, right? He's got, um, he's literally building rocket ships. I mean, that's pretty incredible, but he's also making cars. Like, it's so crazy that he's got something that's so attainable for all of us to actually see and touch and feel. And then this other thing that is so space aged and, and feels out of reach, but he's making this future happen but for Elon, it's already happened. It's already done. He is a time traveler because he's seen it and now he's starting to live it. And that's incredible. But for such a technology intense company, what's interesting is Elon, he definitely has an affinity for math for sure. But how many of you think that Elon, when he goes into work each day, is sitting there with a pen and paper figuring out math problems? No, I don't think so. <laughs> no, right? What's actually doing all of the math for him now? Well, the computers, the, you know, all the AI that he's got working for him. Exactly. So for Elon, it's all of the human skills that's not only making him feel, I mean, think of how excited this dude must be when he wakes up in the morning. Like he is building rocket ships for gosh sakes. Like he is so stoked. So Elon is waking up in the morning, doing his dream, his passion, making his vision come true, but it's his human skills that's made him successful. Cause there's a lot of people out there who are really good at math. There's a lot of people out there who understand cars. There's even people who understand rocket ships. Yet Elon's the one making the most waves. He's making the biggest difference in the shortest amount of time. And it's because he has these human skills. So to list some of them, he's great at not only having a vision, so he's a visionary, but he's a great communicator because when he talks, people are interested in hearing him. He's also had to deal with a lot of investors and things along the way, so he's great at persuasion. He's great at, although there, there might be some controversy on, on whether he's a nice leader, he is a leader because he's managed to rally people around his vision to help make these dreams come true. So a lot of human skills that's made this person exceptional. But what about her? I mean, she probably barely uses a cell phone if we're honest, you know, but she has become like just the most household name, yet there was nothing going for her in the beginning, right? She, though, leaned into her human skills. It had nothing to do with what she learned in school, right? It wasn't just the academic stuff that made her who she was. It was her people skills. But what, here's what's interesting is skills like Oprah's, whether it was the 80s, the 90s, 2000, 3000, she could still be a famous person. It's because of those human skills, they don't expire. So she's an incredible communicator. She's great at empathy. She's a great listener. 
she leans into all these human skills and that's why she's always been relevant and will continue to be relevant even when everything is working against her to get to where she is today. Steve Jobs, did you know he doesn't even code? He never, he, he wasn't a coder. He has a computer company. How crazy is that? You don't have to have the technical skills in order to make it a credible change in the world. Instead, he's a great communicator. He's quite the performer. Everybody loved those Apple release dates, right? When he gets on stage and says, let me show you the future. So he's a great visionary. He has tenacity, resiliency. He didn't care when someone told him he was crazy. He didn't care when somebody said that's not going to work. And you know what? Then it wouldn't work because he would just keep trying it until it did. So resiliency, tenacity, perseverance. Greta, you also don't have to be old. You don't have to be a grown up. And she, conventionally speaking, when you think of an incredible um, communicator, you don't think of someone who's on the spectrum, yet she is someone who's able to move people all over the world with her message. She has a vision. She too is a time traveler. She sees the future. She's kind of scared about it. And that's why she's communicating. She doesn't even have the solutions. She's not coming up with the rocket ship to put us on Mars. Instead, she's an advocate. She's a, someone who's persuading and communicating and has empathy and, and drive and talk about resiliency in such a young age. And just, just for fun, how do you know, Michael, do you even know who this is? I uh, can't say that I do, no. Yeah, you'll know as soon as I tell you what he did. This is Ray Kroc. He uh, is the guy who grew a whole hamburger franchise called McDonald's. <laughs> yeah. So you also don't necessarily have to be someone who wants to change the entire world. If you love art, if you love dance, if you love trees and puppy dogs or like Ray, in fact, I don't even know that he liked hamburgers. He just loved the idea of growing a business and perfecting the burger. That's also cool because gosh knows McDonald's certainly changed the world for better or worse, depending on who you talk to, but he grew a hamburger franchise. I mean, that's just so cool. So I want you to visualize who do you want to be? And I also want to take a bit of the pressure off because depending on your age, people might be pushing you going, follow your passion, follow your passion. What's your passion? I don't know what my passion is. I haven't had any time to explore it. There's so many options out there. So you don't have to choose those things. You don't have to know what you want to be when you grow up. You don't have to know what your passion is. But if you know who you want to be, how you want to feel, then let's start working backwards from that. And that's going to help us to kind of determine some of the things that you could start leaning into that are not only going to be really fulfilling for you, but they're going to be forever valuable to the world around you, just like Oprah, just like Elon. Elon, even if he came in 100 years from now and rocket ships had already been made that landed on Mars, he'd still be innovating because he could still see the future from there. That's never going to go out of style. All right. So, Leah, we actually got a uh, question here. If we want to uh, yeah, jump sure. in on a question, uh, uh, Sumya asked, uh, looking at all these people that you just uh, that you just gave um, examples of, can we conclude that in order to be successful, um, you have to be a visionary as well? Yes, would be the short answer, but let me elaborate on that for you. Elon is imagining an entire second economy ecology, everything on Mars, right? And that can be intimidating because you're going, my gosh, I can barely remember my grocery list, let alone, you know, what logistics would go into to making Mars inhabitable. Or I guess not a grocery list, maybe for this crew, your homework assignments. <laughs> <laughs> but you do have to be a visionary, but around the things that you care about, right? Like maybe you love, you know, puppy dogs. I bring this up because a friend of mine actually wants to start a dog sanctuary and he's done nothing in his entire life to do with dogs ever, but he's just decided, man, that really matters to me. And he can see it when he closes his eyes. He's like, I can see it. Like the kennels would be there and the dogs would come in and we bathe them and we give them so much love. And then we would like find perfect owners for them. When I ask you to think about who you wanna be, that's also being a visionary. 
It's picturing who do you want to be? So the vision doesn't have to be like Greta saying, we have to serve the world. It can be, I'd love to have another place in my community that like kids could play and hang out at. What if, what if we made a skateboard park? I could see it. There's an empty lot right in my neighborhood. We could make a skateboard lot. You know what? I could go and I could talk to the mayor and the counselors. There's kids who are 10 years old who go to council meetings in their city to petition to say, I would really like this in my community. And your vision also doesn't have to be something that is just one vision. You can have 10 visions. You can have 10 things that you're excited about, or maybe you only know one vision now, and then when you accomplish that, then you find another one, and then another one. So yes would be the short answer, but don't be intimidated with the people that I had on the screen and thinking it has to be huge. It could be something as simple as a vision of what you want tomorrow to be like for you, because you want to have a really good day. All right. Did you want to add anything, Michael? Well, I was just going to, uh, I was just going to ask you, Leah, because um, I'm, I'm curious, what, what did you want to be when you, when you were growing up? And I'm, I'm also, and I guess like the second part to that question is like, what is like, what would you say if somebody asked you sort of like what your vision is for like what you're doing in your life right now? Oh man, when I was a kid, I was very practical because my family encouraged practicality. They said, you need a job. It's got to make a lot of money. It's got to be something that's, you know, needed and and something that's going to be impressive to my friends you know no hating on my parents but you know let's be real my mom really wanted me to get into something that was going to make a lot of money and so i was going to be a pharmacist of all things it seemed perfect i don't have to go all the way into medical school but i'm still in that field and it makes a good living and hey that would be great and then i was going to go into sales because my mom's friend's daughter started working for johnson and johnson selling the stuff that John and I and she was making so much money. So then that became my vision. And so when I was younger, and I think this is why I'm so passionate about giving this talk today, is when I was younger, I very much wanted the things that other people wanted me to be. Mm. They had a vision of who I should be in the future. But I was never given the space to create a vision for myself of who I wanted to be. I didn't really think that was an option. That sounds really silly. Um, but I grew up in the 80s and there was no such thing as women empowerment. There was no such thing as entrepreneurship. There was no, it was owning your own business, which meant you probably like my grandfather hustled cars on the side or something. And it had this negative connotation in the eighties. Every movie was about moving your way up the corporate ladder and everybody hated their boss. So you never actually wanted to make it to the top. And so my vision was very much affected by the people around me and wanting to be loved and appreciated by those people and everything that they said made sense. Why wouldn't you want to be a pharmacist? Why wouldn't you want to be in sales? But I wasn't given the space to actually say, what do you want, Leah, aside from what everybody else wants? Mm. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, for sure. So it took me until my 30s to actually figure out my passion in life, which is what <laughs> I did. <laughs> long story, very long. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So let's jump into some tech stuff because I kind of want to make a bit of a leap. So you got this vision, perhaps now, perhaps you don't have it right now. That's okay. Work on this. Think about yourself. Close your eyes before you go to bed and go, Ooh, what would I love to be when I'm 20, 30, 40, 50, if you want to, you know, think that far ahead. But think of who you want to be, how you feel when you're that person. But now let's talk about what the world wants you to be. So that's a great segue, Michael. Let's talk about what the world wants you to be, because the world needs people. That's how how your your parents get their coffee in the morning when they go to Starbucks they need people to make the coffee that's how you get groceries from your grocery store it's not just people in the grocery store but the people who made all the products and drove the trucks to get the products there and all that kind of stuff but the future is changing so fast and I gotta say I'm pretty excited I love AI technology so AI stands for artificial intelligence now, you may all know this and be rolling your eyes going, yeah, no, duh. But just in case, just in case there's somebody listening or maybe your parents are listening going, what is this AI thing? It's basically the ability for systems to respond with what seems like human-like intuition. But it's, it's algorithms and it's evolving and it can teach itself things. And, and it's growing so much. I'm sure Michael can totally describe AI better than me. But for all intents and purposes, it's cool. And it's evolving everything that we do. But so is robotics. 
right? When I think of robotics back in my day, we had RoboCop and that was pretty cool. These days, everything we have puts RoboCop to shame. And then there's just regular technology. The fact that we're talking and all of you are at home or wherever you are and you're eating and you're chilling and you're hearing me, like that's all technology. And it's evolving really, really quickly. So I wanna show you just a really quick video compilation of some cool robots and to see just how many industries are really changing because of technology. Now, like I mentioned in the roller coaster example though, some people are very scared because there used to be a huge need for physical laborers to take things from one side of the room to another side of the room. Then we got forklifts. And now we don't even need that because at least a person was driving the forklift. Now we don't even need that. And so that can be scary for some people because they're going, am I not valuable anymore? I thought I was valued for what I could do in these very specific ways. And all of a sudden those jobs have disappeared. And with the future changing so fast, I had mentioned how 80% of jobs haven't even been invented yet, just, you know, 10 years from now. How are you supposed to prepare? What are you supposed to study in school? So let's just take a look, not to fear factor this for you, but let's just take a look at some of these robots here and see how cool they are first. Let's, let's be the people excited for the roller coaster instead of scared of the roller coaster. So these are robots and they are moving completely autonomously, meaning nobody's controlling them. There's no remote control. They can grab things, they can be, have coordination. Wouldn't it be great to never have to do dishes again? Now I would love this, not have to cook and it's edible, so that's a bonus. So we've got robots doing things that people have done. Imagine you show up to a, a kitchen and there's just one chef and the rest are all robots. But it's not just the physical stuff, they can do mental stuff like play chess when they have no idea what the other person's move is gonna be and they can respond. This is that whole forklift example I was giving you. This used to have a person on every forklift. It used to have people walking around the floor taking scans of barcodes in a big warehouse, and now we have no people. And then check this out. Robots that basically hover over shelving, and when they need to pull something from the shelf, it just drops down, grabs the item, puts it in a bin, brings it to the person who packages it. This is where Amazon is going towards never having to worry about injuries. Think of how many injuries used to happen. My mom, she wasn't even driving the forklift, but she broke her ankle because she tripped over the forklift. So just the fact that we don't have to worry about those things is kind of cool. And then robots taking the full delivery thing all the way to your doorstep. It's an autonomous self-driven vehicle that has a robot in the back of it that drops your package off, navigates around things on the ground. Very cool. And what about farming? Farming is traditionally something super labor intensive, not just by people, but horses and cows and bulls. Now we've got things that are planting the seeds, watering the seeds, fertilizing the seeds. They're giving it the perfect amount of sunlight. They're even picking it. Then it goes straight to packaging. And then, you know, Uber, Uber, watch out. Uber was this revolutionary company that just completely changed the taxi driving business. But now Uber, you know, they're already looking at this because they're like, this is going to put us out of business, is vehicles that don't even need people to drive them. I mean, Elon, he's already taken care of that, right? We got self-driving cars already. And the technology for them to know what's happening from people to debris on the road to street lights. It's incredible. And in fact, it's more accurate than humans because we could be having a conversation and completely miss that stop sign, but a machine would never do that. Now this one can really get you squirrely though, because they can now make machines as small, smart, and strong as ants. So next time you see an ant, when you step on it, see if it's gooey or is it robotic-y? All right. what, is that, what exactly are those uh, robotic ants doing? I think that was more of just like a prototype to be like, hey, can we get them to move and use the same intuition algorithms as an ant would for being able to move things from point A to point B, using things in a collaborative nature? I mean, talk about teamwork. Um, that's how ants accomplish everything is in teamwork, right? And so yeah. they were seeing if they could get the uh, robots to respond accordingly. Cool. Yeah, yeah. 
So I'm kind of excited about that, right? But I, I love roller coasters. So I want to get you really, really excited about this as well. Now, we talked about the video, we've talked about some of the stuff. So how do you stay relevant? Well, we've talked about the people who are making big changes in the world, and whether they're in a tech business or a non-tech business, it's the human skills that are really making the difference. Now, these human skills have actually a technical name, and it's a terrible name, but this is what they're actually called. They're called soft, soft skills. So soft skills sound kind of lame, right? Anything soft just sounds kind of, um, but they're really significant. And that's why I call them human skills because what's so great about human skills, AI and robotics have a really, really tough time duplicating them. So would it make sense then that if we lean into being more human, better humans, if you will, in fact, I have a hat that says it on there. It was sent to me the other day. I'm so excited about it. It says, making humans better humans. I was like, yes. Because if we can become just better humans, then that vision you have of yourself walking around, people are around you, maybe nobody's around you, maybe you're covered in puppies. So much of that is you visualizing yourself as a human and feeling that happiness. When we can lean into our human skills, we tend to feel more fulfilled. We tend to feel happier. And it also allows us to discover what matters to us. If we don't know what matters to us, we don't know where to lean in. And then you can fall into the trap that I fell into, which is relying on other people to tell me what matters. And then I just wanna do what matters to them. And it takes me a long time to figure out why I'm not feeling super excited to do my work every day. And it's because it's not my work, it's somebody else's. So let's become better humans. There's a huge number of skills. There's actually no deciding factor on how many skills there are, but it's well over 100 human skills. So in some areas, you might be already really good at these skills. In other areas, you might be not as good. And then others, you haven't even, you didn't even know that skill existed. I mean, persuasion? Well, kids know. Kids know persuasion because you persuade your parents for candy when you go to the store. You persuade them to keep you, you know, can I stay up past my bedtime? So yeah, now you, you get persuasion. But there's a lot of other ones out there that you may not have known. And I'll just show really quickly, actually, a website just to show you how many there are. So this is a list of over 80 of them. But things like humor. Do you love being kind of funny? Are you quick-witted? Are you a really good listener? Do you find that your friends are always coming to you because they need to talk? You might be an incredible listener. Body language, writing, public speaking, mentoring, diplomacy, um, supervising, managing. So all those leadership things. What about when things go wrong? Have you ever felt like, oh my gosh, something just really went wrong? And you found that you were really good at being that mediator and managing the crisis and helping keep everyone calm, everyone feeling, feeling good still. That's an incredible superpower. Facilitation, inspiring, persuasion, negotiation. I mean, the list just goes on and on. You are already an incredible human. But the problem is, how do you grade someone on a report card because they have good resiliency? You can't. And so never does anybody ever talk about how incredible you are at these human skills. And the irony is, is that's the skills that's gonna make you so valuable to your community, to your family, to the world when you get older. So I really wanna highlight these, these soft skills. That's gonna make you just feel that fulfillment and, and those skills, it doesn't matter the what. So whether you help puppy dogs, whether you help senior citizens, kids, babies, trees, sharks, mammals, birds, I'm looking out my window, just no matter what it is that you want to help in the world, it doesn't matter. Because when you really sculpt these human skills, you're going to be able to do anything that you want. Now, how do we do that? Well, the problem is I've kind of, you know, mentioned one, there's some toxic habits out there that we can have that happen in our brain. And we need to kind of start to become aware of it so that we can replace them with positive habits. So that's what I want to walk through with all of you here is to give you some tools you can walk away with that will help to reprogram your brain. Now, this sounds really huge. It sounds like 
brain surgeries involved, or we're going to need to like hook you up to electrodes and then like, and then like it'll rewire. But honestly, your brain is an incredible tool. And what's so interesting about your brain is it's a little bit like a puppy dog, maybe a golden retriever. Some puppy dogs are a little disobedient. Golden retrievers, very obedient. So right now I'm moving my fingers. I have my hands up, I'm rocking back and forth. I would not be able to do this unless I told my brain that I wanna move my fingers. Our brains do what we tell it to, but if we're not cautious, we're what, if we're not conscious, if we aren't deliberate about the things that go into our brain, then sometimes the negative stuff gets in there and that throws us completely off course. Those are the things that make us feel bad. Those are the things where when we, we wake up in the morning and we go, I don't know why, I just don't feel like doing anything today. I just kind of feel not good about myself. I'm kind of, kind of angry. I kind of just, I hate that I have homework. I, I don't like that my mom made me have to come home from playing with friends when I was having such a good time. That kind of negative talk that can happen in our head can start to cycle and become a little toxic to us. And well, let's be honest, when we're feeling negative feelings like that, it can be, it can feel almost impossible to feel happy again. It can feel almost impossible to make those visions, those dreams that we have come true because it just feels too far away, feels too hard, feels like we're not the right person to do it. So let's talk about the toxic habit, one of the number one toxic habits that can happen, that can program our brain negatively. And then we're gonna talk about the things that we can do to fix that. So the first one is called labeling. And here's what is just too darn bad about this. Labeling happens by accident and on purpose. And we not only label ourselves, but we label other people all the time. And other people label us all the time. Now, depending on how that person is feeling or how you're feeling at the time will depend on whether that negative label imprints on our brain or not. And the person who does that, so imagine a coach or a teacher said a label to you that was positive or negative, you may really respect them and want them or rather care about their opinion that when they say those things, it imprints even deeper. So let me give you an example. Some people say, oh, they're too shy. They would never do that. You're such a klutz. Come on, let's get going. You're so slow, just get your shoes on and let's get going. You're so good at math, man, you're just such a natural at it. It's like your thing. You have two left feet. There is no way you're gonna be able to dance. Let's see, you're a dreamer, you're loud, you're sloppy. Would you go put on a clean shirt already? You're so sloppy, my gosh, I can't take you anywhere. You're so smart, you're so funny. These are all labels. Now, many of them are often said in jest, meaning kind of just, oh, you're so, you're so funny. You're so sloppy. Oh my gosh, you're such a klutz. And they're not meaning to hurt you. The problem is though, is we laugh with them. And then soon you go to a park and you sit down with some friends and someone goes, hey, do you want to throw the Frisbee? And you're like, no, nah, I'm such a klutz. You don't want to play Frisbee with me. And all of a sudden you start to reinforce that, but you laugh about it. It's not a big deal, right? And being a klutz is no big deal. Yet it's now something that's in your head. So the next time that a really fun opportunity to go for a hike comes up, to go do a fun race, a sports day, you just assume you're not going to do well because you're such a klutz, you know? And then it's not funny anymore. And so that labeling is something that we do to others, sometimes without even thinking, because we don't mean anything bad by it. But sometimes there's bullies out there and they do mean it and they want to hurt you. So it's tough because that labeling just kind of sticks in our head. And, and like the example of moving our fingers, if our brain, if we start saying, man, I can't do that, our brain goes, okay, we can't do it. Does exactly. Well, you told it to, right? It's obedient. It's a golden retriever, but it's not true. It's not true. There's nothing in your physical makeup or mental makeup that you can't do. 
And a great example is the Paralympics. How many people would look at somebody who lost their legs or more, maybe they were born that way and be like, that person's gonna be a champion skier. Like they would never think that. So often we just go, oh, they'll never be in sports. Yet every day there's Paralympic athletes who ski, who bike ride, who climb Mount Everest. That is someone who has told their brain, I can do anything. And so their brain obeys. And that is the power that you can have with positive labeling. But so often the labeling is actually um, taken in a negative way. So you can do anything. But here's the caveat. You can do anything if you want to. So don't worry about the things you don't want to be good at. If you don't want to run a marathon, I have never had the desire to run a marathon. So when someone says you can't run a marathon, I go, okay, I don't care. <laughs> I don't want to, but you know what I do want to do? I really want to learn tennis. It's bothered me that I've just never been good at tennis. Or let me use some examples of labels that were given to me growing up. Um, when I graduated and I got my first place, um, I made the mistake of cooking for my mother and it was not very good. And from ever since that point, I can't cook. It was the label that was given to me. Oh my gosh, Leah, you burnt this. This is terrible. You just, oh, you're just so funny. You can't cook. And that label just kind of stuck with me. And what's interesting, our brains are really good at finding evidence for things that they want to believe in. So everywhere I turned, I'd be like, man, I can't even make like craft dinner. I thought you screw up craft dinner. And it just reinforced and reinforced gardening. I love flowers. I have flowers right there. I have flowers there, 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 there. I have flowers everywhere. But you know what? I killed everything that came into my house 10 years ago because I believe that I couldn't keep anything alive in this house that was green. But when I understood labeling and I started to relabel myself and some of the things that I'm going to teach you next here, I'm an amazing cook. I cooked duck the other day. You are so not impressed by that. Michael might be impressed. I'm like, who cooks duck at home? I cook duck, I cook squid. I was like, Psh, I am a chef. I am an amazing cook. And anything I haven't cooked yet, I may screw up the first time, but you know what? I'm gonna get better at it because that's just what happens. And it matters to me. So that's why I'm getting better at it. So what are the things that you look at and you've ever said to yourself, I wish I could do that. I wish I was as good at you, good as you are at whatever this thing is. Those are the things that you want to start rewiring your brain on because somewhere along the way, you picked up a label and that label told you you couldn't do that. So let's talk about how we rewire things. So the first thing to rewire your brain is one simple word. So you're going to, you're going to roll your eyes. You're going to be like, this is not going to work. One word, yet. So remember how I said that your brain is like a golden retriever. It does whatever you tell it to. So the moment that you say, I can't do it, it goes, okay. But if you say, I can't do it yet, your brain goes, yeah, okay. We'll be able to do it because you haven't closed the door. And it sounds so ridiculous and stupidly simple rewiring your brain in one word. It really does though, because your brain does exactly what you tell it to do. So the more you can just start programming your brain to know that it's always going to be able to get better at anything, it will always get better at anything. It's a really cool phenomenon. But this is something that you can do to empower yourself, but also other people. So maybe you see a friend and they're like, man, I totally fell. I can't do that yet. And even though they'll roll their eyes and go, oh, ha, ha, ha their brain heard it and it won't close the door on them being able to get better at that thing. And they may not believe it. It may take more than one time, but you can say yet to yourself, to your mom, to your dad, to your friends, to even your teacher. Anytime you hear someone label themselves saying that they can't do it, you know, I, I can't do it yet. I'm not good at it. I'm just, I'm not good at it. I'm not good at math yet. It's incredible how that will change your brain and you'll feel it. You'll almost feel a tingle in your brain. And that tingle I kind of label as optimism. <laughs> it's gonna happen when you start using the power of yet. All right, habit number two. 
your alter ego. Now we all have a voice in our head and the voice is sometimes our best friend. A lot of times it's not. And so often we think that this is our voice. So the voice will often do things in cycles. So sometimes maybe, maybe you fell down at lunch and people laughed. And then the rest of your day, your mind is circling and circling going, man, I shouldn't have done that. That was so stupid. Oh, if I had just tied my shoelaces that day, oh, what did I trip on? I don't understand. And your brain just keeps cycling on it. It's really frustrating, a lot of anger, a lot of just anger towards yourself can really build in that. But here's the thing, remember we talked about labels. More often than not, any label that you've been given has been given from something outside of you. Somebody laughed at you when you tried doing something and you didn't do it very well. The media told you that children of this age tend to be really bad at X. Your teacher gave you an F on something and perhaps didn't articulate what she was thinking in a certain way and you took it to heart. Your mom telling you you're so slow, put your shoes on, we need to get going. And now you just always assume, well, I'm just a slow person. I'm just kind of sluggish, just who I am. That is often the voices that are cycling in your head. Remember I said your brain likes to find evidence around it? Every time it finds evidence that reinforces one of those bad labels, it goes, see, see, I told you, I told you, you sucked at that. And then it cycles it and cycles it and cycles it. But it's not your voice, right? It's not yours. Because here's the reality. When you were born, when all of us were born, we were born as kind people, good people. We're all good people. You're an incredible person. But over time, we've collected these voices, and it sounds like our own voice, and it's not. So that's why I call it our alter ego. And what really makes this rewiring of the brain work is you name it. So I named mine Francine. Francine is a bit of a meanie. She likes to dwell on things, and I totally don't appreciate it. You can name yours whatever you want. There was um, a friend of mine. He named his Mike. Not because Mike's a bad name or if your name is Mike, you're a totally awesome person. But he knew somebody that was kind of mean to him growing up named Mike. And he said, this is Mike talking to me right now. That's his alter ego. So what name would you have for yours? Because here's how you use this. And this is all about self-awareness. You are gaining so much knowledge that honestly, Michael, I think, you know, a lot of us don't realize this till we're way late in our 30s, if not 40s. <laughs> figuring out like, oh, these are the miracles of life that I wish I was given advice on as a kid. So you will have a huge head start here. And what you want to do is you want to separate yourself from the voices. And every time there's something happening, maybe they're being mean to someone else. Maybe this voice is making fun of someone else because they fell. And you know, when I fell, somebody made fun of me. And so that voice goes, <laughs> they're stupid. You go, Francine, you're not being very nice today. Nope, don't appreciate that. Maybe Francine is just kind of poo-hooing everyone. Man, nothing fits. I don't like my clothes. My sneakers suck. What can have bitter sneakers? And you go, you're kind of grumpy today, Francine. Like, what's your problem? Or you might just say, you know what, Francine, I'm kind of over this. You've been cycling on this topic for a while. I think we should shelf it. I'd like to talk about something else. What happens here is usually when you start cycling, what happens is, is you start to get mad at yourself for continuing to get mad at yourself. And you're like, why do you keep doing this? Stop doing this, stop getting angry at yourself. When you can detach yourself from the voice in your head and call it a different name, it's so much easier for your brain to go, oh, we aren't that. Okay, okay, we're not that. And it creates this separation for you. You can then kind of hate and get angry at the voice instead of yourself. And so much of any kind of empowerment that you will feel has to come from a place of love. You can only do, you know how many people hate Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, so many people, but they love themselves. And it's because they love themselves that they're able to go, I don't care, I'm going to keep doing this. It makes me happy. So they have an alter ego as well. They have voices that they certainly have had plugged into their head, but they're able to at this stage ignore them but it's tough for some of us. It's tough for me to ignore it. And so I name it. 
and her name is Francine and she is a meanie and I tell her to go away a lot. And it's really helped me to stop hating myself for being so mean or grumpy or whatever the case may be. So those are your couple of tips for you. But the main thing that I want you to know is you are capable of truly so much more than you even think is possible. And until you really stretch and grow, you'll never know what that is. In fact, Michael and I, I mean, we're oldies, look at us compared to all you on this call, yet we still don't even know all of what we're capable of. But when it comes to humans in general, it's infinite of what we can do. Look at an Olympian. I mean, Olympians, you look and you go, whoa, you're the fastest person in the world. But then next year they do it even faster. Climbing Mount Everest was like this huge feat. People do it shirtless in bare feet now. It is not a big feat. So we have not even begun to know the limits of human capability. You are human and completely capable as well. So enjoy your journey of discovery. Hopefully you will find some value in these tips. I know they seem super low tech, but I promise you that is how you rewire a human mind. Awesome. Thank you so much, Leah. You are um, very inspirational. Um, I feel like you um, were talking directly to me when you were naming all of those things, all those labels, um, because I, I was labeled a lot of different things. Some of them even positive that sent me down, you know, um, you know, the wrong path, you know, like just sort of like, you're tall, you should play basketball. Like, no, I'm terrible at basketball. No. <laughs> and maybe you don't even like basketball. So what does it matter? Right? Exactly. Like, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So um, uh, I have a few questions for you. Anyone uh, that's watching, uh, if you have any questions uh, for Leah on how to be a better human and all of the uh, amazing tips that uh, Leah gave us um, um, in this guise of the future that um, we're all heading towards, um, you know, Einstein um, said that the era of time only has one direction. So unfortunately, you know, unlike Marty McFly, we can't go back. We're going this one direction no matter what. Right? Well, I don't know, Michael. I will say this. There could be someone on here who creates the first time machine. <laughs> Anything is possible. Uh, that this is true. This is very true. Uh, throw into the chat if you have any questions for Leah, but um, I'll start us off, Leah, you know, you know, I would like to get into some specifics on some of the soft skills that you that you had mentioned. Uh, you know, there's a uh, it's a wonderful list. But if you're a young person, and I can certainly see myself, you know, asking this question, like, where do I start to develop any of those? You know, like they all they all look great. Do I have any of those? You know, like like how do you evaluate sort of like as a young person who hasn't had much experience out in the world yet? You know, how do you develop and how then do you evaluate if you are good at or, or what you need to be better at? For sure. So the first thing to remember is every single thing on that list you already all embody to a degree. And skills, unlike, you know, when you take a math test, either you got it right or you got it wrong, there's no middle ground, pretty much everything else in life, including science, has no right answer to it. So it's a twofold question that'll answer for you. For one, there's no right place to start. Start with the place that makes you the most happy and just start building from there. Because often when you develop one soft skill, it goes into another one. So if you want to be a really great communicator, but maybe you are a writer. You don't like public speaking. So you're just becoming, you're gonna write. That's awesome. But then people start asking you, can you, can you come share what you wrote about? We just love it. Kind of like this today. You know, they asked me, can you talk about this? And I go, yeah, I would love to. And so now as a writer, maybe you're not great at um, verbally communicating, but you start and then you get better. And then from there, you get a little bit of Ray Kroc in you, which was that McDonald's founder. He's very persuasive. And so then you start to realize much like Greta, um, where when I talk and people listen, maybe I can try to persuade them to feel and understand what I'm feeling and understanding about the world. And so one skill often goes in the other. The other thing is you're never done. So the two, two life-changing things that I learned is there's no right answer ever in anything in life. And two is you're never done. So every skill, when I say you already embody it to a degree, it's because we're all on a spectrum. You're not either a great communicator or a bad communicator. Oprah 
is a great communicator. Yet, if you asked her, she'd say, oh, I could so do better though. There's certain things about how I, I move and I talk and I make eye contact I'd love to get better at. It's always a spectrum. So feel relaxed in that you don't have to choose the right, which are the million dollar skills, right? There is no million dollar skill. They're all valuable to society. Lean into the ones that you already feel excited about first. So communication being that example, if you prefer writing over talking or talking over writing, lean into that. And then the other is you're never done. So even when you're like, I am an amazing athlete, look at my agility, talk to an Olympian, they're never done, right? You're never done. So never feel like you're trying to cross a finish line. Just start, start to lean into it feel excited, ask for feedback, be conscious about how you can improve it and why you want to improve it. And like I mentioned as well, though, and to Michael's example of basketball, only improve it to the degree that you want to improve it. If it doesn't matter to you to be a great public speaker, and instead you'd rather be a good team builder and collaborator and communicate in small groups instead of, you know, big stages, that's totally cool. It's all a spectrum. Yeah. Just lean in. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a great example. And I think like a good, a good tip as well that I'm sort of like here, what you're hearing is, you know, maybe you don't want to be a good public speaker, but if you're like working on a team, maybe you want to be befriend someone that is a good public speaker so they can be the public speaker for you. They can advocate for the, the, the skills that you may need to work on. And maybe in return, you can give something to them. Right. Yes. Steve Jobs. Couldn't have done it without having someone who knew code, right? Yeah. Um, oh my gosh, his name is starts with a W. What is the name of his partner? Uh, I want to say yeah. I, can't, I so now it's gone off my brain as well. Uh, right? He he was uh, he was the owner of the uh, the Seahawks, uh, right? <laughs> that dude. Yeah. That he, <laughs> find your find your running mates in life and realize that that list that I showed you the Paul goal is Allen. not to be. <laughs> the, it just came to me, Paul Allen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Paul Allen, is that it? Well, yeah, he worked with him, but no, it was the guy who did all the coding with Steve, Steve Wozniak. There you go. Yeah. I knew it was a W. Yes. So Steve Wozniak. So you don't have, the goal is not to be great at all of those. So let's use Elon Musk. He is a little controversial or even Steve Jobs, you know, they were known for being incredible communicators, but not the best team builders, but incredible visionaries that it was such good communicating of the vision, it overcompensated that people still wanted to be on their team, even though they were kind of angry people sometimes, right? So the goal is not to be perfect because there's no such thing as being perfect in all of them. The goal is not to be amazing at all of them. It's just to lean into the ones that you like and that will lead you on the path of where you should keep leaning in. You don't have to have all the answers today. Amazing. Thank you uh, so much, Leah. Um, this is uh, this has been amazing. Um, if people want to hear more from you, if they can follow uh, your work, all of the amazing organizations that you work with, um, where can people go? Yeah. So um, one of my organizations is Build a Biz Kids. And the other one is BBK Network. I think both of them are on the event right there. So you can Google those and they'll pop up. Um, and then you can, I, you might be too young to have a LinkedIn, but you can tell your parents, they can find me, just type in my name. And LinkedIn is always the best way to get a hold of me directly. But you're welcome to reach out to any of the organizations and you can ask for me and they'll find me. <laughs> uh, we didn't get into it, but uh, what is Build a Bit Biz Kids? Sure. So we are pretty much looking at education and tying that to the future and saying, what is it that kids should be really leaning into? And we really focus on those things that's hard to capture on a report card, which are these human skills. So we often use things like entrepreneurship or public speaking or advocacy, social impact as mediums to help kids get to make their own money, make their own decisions kind of get involved in their community and make an impact because here's the thing you really don't have to be an old person to make an impact um, you can truly be making a huge change that's positive in your community today if that's a direction you want to go in you can also just be leaning into your skills that make you really happy as a human at this age you don't have to wait till you're older and so we try to empower kids through our programs we also innovate a lot of cool technology like virtual reality programs and all kinds of stuff 
Awesome. Well, speaking of uh, your backstory and speaking of innovation, uh, we're going to be on the next episode of Let's Innovate. So uh, that is the uh, BC Science Fair uh, Foundation podcast that I host. Uh, so make sure to uh, find that on your uh, podcast uh, listening app, Spotify, Apple, wherever you find it. Uh, we're going to be recording um, on Friday, I think. So that's going to be an episode that's going to be coming out uh, very soon. Uh, quick uh, reminder on some dates that we have coming up. So June 10th, that is the Youth Innovation Showcase Finals. Uh, if you know someone that's in the Youth Innovation Showcase or you haven't entered but you're curious as to, to see uh, what people come up with, you can watch. Uh, it's going to be uh, really fun. I'm going to be there hosting some amazing youth that have come up with some amazing innovations. Uh, did it online last year. It's going to be another uh, online uh, party uh, again in celebration of all these kids that have worked so hard all year. Um, and we are going to be back with a Another uh, workshop, uh, RBC um, uh, is going to be doing a workshop with us on June 16th. We just uh, announced that. So go to our website. Um, I see that Alyssa, my colleague, is uh, dropping uh, some links uh, to all of those events uh, on Science Fair. And you can go to the website and check out all of the initiatives that we have, including our big fundraiser, Sweating for Science. Uh, we are running, uh, or at least I'm running, uh, and raising money uh, for science fair kids. Uh, you can go um, and uh, help us out. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, that is going on until May 30th. So you still got time if you want to get out there and, uh, and raise some money. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Leah. Uh, amazing. I'm super inspired. I uh, can't wait to talk to you on the podcast. Uh, for me, Michael, take care.